Hi everyone. So uh, this is Kazia uh, again. I'm very very happy to welcome you to our second guest lecture uh, by uh, Professor Pauline Foster. Uh, she's my uh, colleague, friend, and of course my sensei mentor. <laughs> and uh, uh, by the way, Pauline Foster was in Japan uh, for for se several years to teach English. So anyway, she knows a little bit of Japanese. Let me introduce Pauline Foster. Professor Pauline Foster worked at St. Mary's University for 31 years. Wow, congratulations. As a full professor teaching and supervising a number of undergraduate and postgraduate students. She's the foundation leader of the, fun uh, the London Second Language Education Research Forum, LSRAF, a group of SLA academic Academics working and uh, working in and around the London. Her contribution to the SLA community is tremendous and very helpful for especially for young scholars like me to integrate. And Pauline Foster has published extensively on her expertise on task-based language learning, classroom interaction, formulaic language, and research methodology. In particular, or TBLT work on uh, uh, with uh, Peter Skin, the influence of planning and task type on second language performance has been selected as one of the most representative publications in the top tier journal studies in second language acquisition. And on top of that, her discourse analysis framework, everyone must know about this AS unit, uh, which she proposed and published in Applied Linguistics uh, 2000, uh, has been widely used in the field of SLA. Today, I asked Pauline to present my favorite project of hers. Uh, she's going to share with us the up-to-date status of her ESRC uh, research-funded uh, project, which has already resulted in a number of groundbreaking findings and publications about the mechanism underlying ultimate attainment. So how far we can go and age effects, how, why younger is better, and the context, uh, why age effects on SLA different between classroom and naturalistic settings. So uh, we're very lucky to have Pauline as a guest lecturer for our YouTube lecture series. And uh, now the floor is yours, Pauline. Thank you. Thank you very well, much, thank you. for your introduction. Um, so I just want to say hello from uh, London. It's January, it's 2021. Uh, we're under severe lockdown. So I'm sheltering in my house hardly able to go out anywhere and certainly can't go and haven't been able to go out and get my hair cut for a very long time. Um, but nevertheless, um, the, the, the life of the mind goes on. So uh, I'm keeping myself uh, amused and busy by continuing with um, fun projects like this one that Casia has invited me to be part of. So what I'm doing today is giving some kind of overview of a research project uh, that was basically uh, data was collected some time ago and we have gradually worked our way through uh, understanding what it means and publishing what it means. Um, and today I'm just going to give you um, the, an update really on what, what we did and what we think we found. Um, I'm focusing on part of, the, part of the project here, which looks at implicit learning and more syntactic attainment in an L2 and the interplay of that with a variety of influences. And I need to, um, to, to give a, a special shout out here to uh, two institutions, um, St. Mary's where I worked and the University of York where Silcher works, and especially to Silcher who's been on this project since the beginning, which was a very long time ago, it seems to me. And a shout out also to the Economic and Social Research Council, which uh, funded all of this um, and made it possible. I've put up here on the screen um, two uh, publications which are already out, uh, arising from the, the project. And one in blue at the bottom, which isn't out yet, but we hope it will be out soon in language learning. And I'm actually going to be talking mostly to uh, the last one. So it's not published yet, um, but perhaps by the time you're looking at this, uh, it will be out and you'll be able to go and read it up uh, properly. So just by way of introduction, Implicit learning, which we'll call IK, of language structures, whatever they are, whether they are morphological or phonological rules or vocabulary items, whatever, is the only route 
that can be taken for the acquisition of somebody's first language or first languages. And the product of implicit language learning is, of course, implicit language knowledge, which means that you can't reflect on it consciously and you have no memory of having acquired it. By contrast, the other route to language knowledge, which is explicit learning, is available to teenagers and adults. And this is what's presented to them when they have a textbook or a dictionary or they're participating in classroom teaching or they are consciously reflecting on what they're doing. Uh, they're in receipt of corrective feedback where the language is described to them using uh, metalinguistic terms and where they can engage in deliberate memorizing and application of rules. It's very, very different. Then. And this gradual replacement of an entirely implicit language learning experience with a largely explicit language learning experience is what accompanies an individual's uh, developing cognitive maturity as they move out of childhood. And that's been well established because it's you know, been an awful lot of talk and publications on critical periods or sensitive periods and how we separate earlier from um, uh, older learners. And of course, there's the fundamental difference hypothesis put forward by Blay Roman in, in 1990, which is saying that these two things, there is a fundamental difference between children learning language and adults learning language. Investigations into both these hypotheses, uh, generally speaking, have focused on uh, morphosyntax for good or ill. That tends, tends, tends to be what is looked at ultimate morphosyntactic attainment in early starters compared to late starters. And typically that's through a grammaticality judgment test. <coughs> now, another dimension of implicit language knowledge is uh, idiomaticity. And that doesn't usually figure very much in looking at ultimate attainment, but more recently it has been Idiomatic combinations of words in any given language are grammatically well formed. That's important, but also they're commonly in use in a speech community. So this narrows the field down from what is possible to looking at only what is attested and actual. And an individual's implicit knowledge enables him or her to be able to distinguish uh, word combinations which are not commonly in use from those which are commonly in use. And often we talk about this uh, as intuition. I'm giving you an example here, because it's one that I uh, have recently been pondering, which is how dare you? It's very commonly in use. I mean, you might not use it very often because you might not think of yourself as the sort of person that goes out, and gets into someone's face and say, how dare you? But it may well have been used to you uh, you may well have seen it a lot, dramatic moments in films, and things like that. Now, the thing about it is it's commonly in use, but it's also ungrammatical. <laughs> and that doesn't matter because it's perceived as grammatical and it's perceived as idiomatic. Very, very quickly show that. Uh, how dare you um, is, is a very strange, uh, actually, construction, which is using ancient rules of making questions in English. If you try to make uh, a, an analogy with that, you had how feel you, um, you'd see straight away, no, that's, that's not right. Hasn't been right, you know, since Shakespeare. Whereas how do you dare, which would be the modern English uh, way of making the question would immediately be perceived as being really weird. How do you dare? You won't hear that one. It's not idiomatic. How do you feel with the hand? Well, that's fine. That's fine. So here you've got this. What I'm trying to, to say is there, you know, in order to make those kind of judgments, you have to draw on your intuition. And that intuition is, is what's telling you what is grammatical, even if it on the surface doesn't look like it's grammatical, it will appear to you to be grammatical because you've heard it. And you've heard it because it's idiomatic. And it's idiomatic because it's used a lot. So implicit knowledge of a language, therefore, 
which is what we're going to be investigating in this project, uh, we can say that it's systematic and that it is invariable. It doesn't leave room for doubt. It's accessed automatically, so you don't, and this is very important in our project, really, you don't have to go away and think about it for a long time or look it up. You access it automatically. Um, if you try to access it consciously, you'll find it to be difficult or impossible. So the knowledge is in your head, but you just can't get to it. You can't reflect on it. And that's because of the way you've acquired it. It underpins fluency. This is also very, very important. We don't want language to be slow and halting. We want it to be fluent. And in order for it to be fluent, it has to draw on this implicit knowledge. And this what also makes it idiomatic. Same thing, same other side of the same coin. And finally, it's incidentally and not intentionally acquired. In fact, you sort of try to acquire um, intuitions intentionally, you find it to be completely impossible. And then if we wanted to put it to use, this is why it, we can use it as a research tool. It enables detection of ungrammatical strings and it enables detection of things which aren't idiomatic. So the question to explore, and um, which I have been exploring for many years now with Silcher, how far and under what conditions is implicit learning preserved in late onset learners? We've made the case that it's the only way that early learners can learn what they learn about language. But how far can that be preserved in late onset learners? Is there anything left of it or has it been replaced by explicit learning? Measuring implicit knowledge uh, is typically done through a grammaticality judgment test. And a grammaticality judgment test is basically presenting your participants with a list of sentences, some of which are grammatical and some of which aren't, and they must make a judgment about each one. Is it grammatical? Is it not grammatical? Now, there's been, uh, I'm sure many of you know, some discussion about whether that is actually a valid way to proceed and that actually it might not exclude these people from having a think about the sentences and therefore accessing their explicit knowledge, not their implicit knowledge, which would render the test pointless. Now, in mitigation of that, you can say, but if the test is an oral test, that is, people don't see it written down, they only hear these sentences. Um, and if it's strictly timed so that they are um, not allowed the leisure to start thinking about whether something is grammatical or not, then you have constrained explicit knowledge to such a degree um, that it doesn't matter. It might even be, with any luck, excluded. So what we'll see in the research I'm going to present shortly is uh, we're going to be using uh, a grammaticality judgment test. And in addition, we are going to be looking at the influence of the learning context, because there are two, immersion and classrooms. Historically, much of the research into this kind of thing has used classrooms as the context of learning, and there haven't been many studies that look at immersion as the context of learning. So what's interesting about this study is that we've got both. We can compare both. In immersion settings, learning is an incidental byproduct of using the language. It's not what using the language is for to acquire um, grammatical structures. It's just to use it to get stuff done, to live your life, to interact with other people. And incidentally, as a byproduct of use comes implicit knowledge. In classrooms, on the other hand, the reason everybody knows why they're in a classroom, they're in a classroom, a language classroom, in order to learn language. It's the focus of, and it's the reason why you're there. It's intentional study. And that supports the development of explicit knowledge, knowledge that you can talk about, knowledge that you can look up, knowledge that you can check, knowledge that you can have feedback on. We're adding age of onset to the mix. By age of onset, we mean how old were you when you started the immersion or you started the classrooms? 
And it's well known that um, age of onset has an effect on language acquisition. Put simply, younger is better. And it can be understood as in, in, in our terms, in the way we're conceiving our research as, as providing us with an interaction with the context of learning. Um, with early onset immersion learners, those are, that is to say children who are chucked in the deep end, if you like, in learning a, another language, are most able to develop implicit knowledge because they're in the perfect environment for it, as well as not being able to use explicit knowledge because they're too young. When late onset classroom learners would be the most able to develop um, explicit knowledge, and in fact, they may be only able to develop explicit knowledge. We don't know how far those circumstances, which are not ideal um, for developing implicit knowledge, nevertheless can deliver a bit of it or a lot of it, we don't know. So the objectives then of this research is to explore the context of learning and, uh, and look and see how it influences um, ultimate attainment in morphosyntax. And we're going to have two groups of um, people who use English as an L2 in the long term. So they've got a lot of experience of it. And also their experience is daily and they are all advanced. And the question we want to ask when we're looking at these groups, there's immersion groups and classroom groups, how similar or different is their attainment? in terms of their implicit knowledge. And of course, you know, when you have got a chance to do a research project and you've got some funding for it, like we were lucky enough to have, uh, you don't want to waste any opportunity for asking additional bits of uh, questions, research questions, an additional variable here, we're adding aptitude. In, in the sense of phonological short-term memory, which is an individual difference for people and implicit pattern learning ability, another individual difference uh, for people. They're measures of aptitude for language learning. And they can be seen as, you know, if, if they're present and if people are, are have this aptitude, this will aid their development of implicit knowledge, even though they would be late onset learners. That's the idea anyway. So the center piece here, the bit of the research I'm going to present is a timed oral grammaticality judgment test. And just as a recap, we're looking at the grammatical competence as displayed in the scores they get on this test of two groups of learners who are long term learners use English daily as an L2. They are matched for their high oral proficiency and they are separated into um, contexts of those who learned in the classroom and those who learned via immersion and their age range goes from childhood to adulthood and we're hoping thereby to illuminate learning processes that otherwise you wouldn't be able to observe only infer from the interaction of these cognitive abilities, that is phonological short-term memory and sequence learning ability, interacting with their age of onset. So that's quite hard to follow. So here's the diagram. So what we're looking at here in the blue on the left is the age of onset divided into early, which means that they are pre-puberty, and late, which means they are post-puberty learners. And the context of learning we've got um, here in green, one group was in the classroom. And that classroom was in Poland. Classrooms, they didn't all go to the same class, by the way. They learned at school in Poland. And in the yellow, we've got the other context of learning, which is immersion. So these are immigrants from Poland to the United Kingdom, either coming over as children before puberty or as adolescents or adults after puberty. 
and we've added to the mix uh, a, a control, a baseline group of UK non-immigrant um, people who were born in the UK and, and have no experience ever of being in Poland. So that's the that's the diagram for these groups that we're looking at. And the sampling criterion, which is, is most important to us, was that they have to have a minimum of 12 years exposure to English. Uh, and this was important because other studies which have looked at this kind of thing and were looking at age effects have often um, got a length of exposure that might only be five years or six years or seven years. We were trying for much longer. The minimum was 12, but for many of them, it was very much longer than that. So it'd be 20 years or 30 years of exposure to English. Um, and here you've got in the diagram, the participants, and you can see there's 35 learners in the UK in an immersion setting, therefore, and 35 learners in Poland who were therefore in a classroom setting. And we've got 20, 30, sorry, 30 native speakers who didn't learn any language except English from childhood because they were born in the UK. <coughs> and you can see the length of exposure is very long. 12 was the minimum, but you can see the maximum for the UK learners, uh, our actual maximum was 67 years. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, no two ways about it, that's a lot. Um, and then the age of onset for the UK um, and is, was between the age of one or 35, and in Poland between the age of five and 30. And of course the age of onset for the native speakers, we just say is birth. And then we have their age at testing. How old were they when we recruited them? You see that there is a little bit of difference there that the UK le you know, learners, well, we got a slightly older, sample compared to the learners in Poland and the native speakers were sitting somewhere in between there. <clears throat> so these people very kindly allow themselves to be subjected to a battery of tests. The grammaticality judgment test was the only one that the native speakers had to do. We weren't interested in the other tests for the other groups. And the grammaticality judgment test was 110 items. It was played on a tape. It was timed. So there were only um, uh, 2000 milliseconds between the first presentation and the second presentation. So they, each sentence was said twice with a very, very small gap between those two. Then there was a, a 3000 millisecond gap um, before the next item was, was uh, pronounced. Really quite hard to listen to, to that for 110 items, but that's what they did. Then the phonological short-term memory test was done in Polish, because it was not on the native speakers of English, but on these two groups of people who were, who were um, Polish speakers, as well as English speakers. And they heard uh, color items told them in Polish, and uh, they had to uh, recall, it was between four and eight, that they would listen to, we were looking to see how good they were at recalling those colours by clicking the actual colours on a, a grid on the screen that they were looking at. And so obviously, you know, the better your recall, um, the better your phonological short-term memory. So if you can only do four colours and you're still making a mistake there, you don't have a very good phonological short-term memory if you're able to do eight colours in a row and get them in exactly the same row. You know, this, this is sort of reminds me of, this is what um, uh, Donald Trump was boasting about uh, a little bit in his dementia test, that he could say, uh, whatever it was, person, woman, man, camera, TV, uh, he was able to say it back. So he was testing his memory there. I didn't think of that until just now, but, you know, now I realise that he was he was doing that kind of test that we were doing. And then there's incidental pattern learning. Um, <clears throat> what uh, they didn't know, these learners were in these sequences that they were listening to. Um, for some of them, there were um, rules of which colors followed which other co colors. And if they were able to abstract the rule, it meant that when we moved on to um, next part of the uh, the test, which was to predict the next colour 
in a pattern. Uh, if they hadn't detected a pattern, then their answer would be random. But if they had detected a pattern, they would be likely to predict the next colour accurately. That is to say, even though we didn't tell them they had to, there was a pattern, they had implicitly, unconsciously, incidentally picked up on it. So the research question is how does context of learning, that is immersion or classroom, influence grammatical judgment performance in learners of high oral proficiency? How would that compare to native speakers doing the same test? And are there any effects uh, which are the same across grammatical and ungrammatical items. Remember, a grammaticality judgment test has both these things. It has to, it has examples which are fine and examples which are kind of breaking some grammatical rules. And are they being treated uh, in the same way by these testees? So here's an example of a grammatical item. Uh, he never takes the bus to work. There's two things that can happen to that in the mind of the person taking the test. They can correctly accept it as grammatical or they could incorrectly reject it as ungrammatical. So if they correctly accept it, we would say, all right, then, you know, you, you, you get the point, you've hit, you've got a hit. If they incorrectly reject it, we put it down as a false alarm. That is to say, they think there's something wrong with it, but there's nothing wrong with it. With ungrammatical items, here's an example, he never take the bus to work. That can be dealt with by being correctly rejected as ungrammatical, or it can be dealt with by being incorrectly accepted, which would mean they missed it. They missed the fact that there was an error there. So we weren't just basically looking at how many did you get right out of 110. We were looking at uh, how did you get them right? And was there a difference between the way you dealt with the grammatical and the ungrammatical items? So if we come to some findings, I'm not going to give you numbers for two reasons uh, or three, actually. It's very boring is one reason. <laughs> the second reason would be that it would really delay me a very long time. And the third reason is this paper's not been published yet and we're yet to be 100 percent blessed on what those numbers are. But nevertheless, I can give you what the findings are. <clears throat> Broadly, the native speakers, uh, when it comes to this grammaticality judgment test, outperform by a lot the performances of the two groups of non-native speakers uh, who are really not much different from each other. Not really a surprise, perhaps, then. Um, but there was an effect for grammaticality. That is to say that both of the non-native speaker groups were less accurate on the ungrammatical items. So when it came to saying yes to things which were grammatical, they were doing much better than being able to say no when it came to things which were ungrammatical. So that emerged from the data quite strikingly. And there was also a group interaction with that grammaticality uh, judgment that the Polish, the non-native speakers from Poland who'd been in classrooms, remember, not in an immersion setting, were much more likely to false alarm than their counterparts who had lived in the UK. Remember, a false alarm is saying that something is wrong when actually it's right. So the research question two was uh, concerning the age of onset. How does it influence the performance on the grammaticality judgment test in learners matched for oral proficiency? And are there any effects, sorry, are those effects the same across the grammatical items and the ungrammatical items? And the findings show that with the non-native speakers in the UK, the age effects, that is to say, for the early starters are categorical. All the early starters had a very good performance and they were separated from the later starters who had a much worse performance. So it's categorical. In Poland, the lot that was doing their English and doing well, remember, they were all very good at English. 
well, they're doing really well uh, in Poland, there was a smaller advantage if they'd started early, which they in primary school, but it wasn't categorical. Here I can show you um, scatter plot here. On the left, you've got the uh, the non-native speakers in the UK. So these are the immersion learners. So they were learning their English just by living here in the UK, not going to school. And the, the um, you've got across the bottom, the, which is cut out. Sorry, I cut that out somewhere. But that's their um, their age of onset, going from naught up to about 35. And it's very clear that the older you are, um, the worse you are. There's a very good, and that red line across the top shows you um, what was our typical native speaker baseline. And you can, you can see that for the very earliest learners who are coming before the age of nine or 10, they are at or even above the native speaker baseline. And there isn't any of them who are below it. And then on the right, you've got the, the non-native speakers who are in Poland and learning in classes. And here you can see there is an age effect as well, but it's not categorical. Uh, there is, if you look at that red line, there's someone who came in their early 20s who is really high, is above the red line. And there's someone who came um, at 12 or so who is also above that red line. But more importantly, possibly, uh, there are people who started learning English when they were under 10. And the dots show you that they really not very good. It's not categorical. But there is a slope. So there, there is a discernible advantage for age, but it's not categorical. And uh, now this one <coughs> is, is actually looking at um, the interaction between, I need to move my picture down there, um, age of onset, grammaticality and context. And uh, this is a bit harder for me to, to talk about because um, it's complicated. <laughs> I prefer that you read it. But what you've got there on the screen is the a, a scatter plot of the native speakers in the non-native speakers in the UK, the immersion ones, and their their uh, age of onset and the number of hits they make. And underneath that, you've got the age of onset and the number of correct rejections. Right, so. Uh, correctly rejecting something which is ungrammatical, they don't do as well as getting correctly identifying things which are grammatical. So, the age of onset isn't a significant factor for grammatical items, things which are part of the English language, but it strongly constrains their performance on detecting things which are ungrammatical. In Poland, by contrast, here, you've got uh, an age of onset and grammaticality interaction. And the age of onset is constrained. Again, at the top, you've got the grammatical, the hits, and at the bottom, you've got the um, uh, the ungrammatical, correctly rejecting. An age of onset is not related to being able to reject things which are ungrammatical. It's helping you out with things which are grammatical, but not with things which are ungrammatical. So the research question three is how do learners' phonological short term memory and pattern learning ability relate to performance on grammatical and ungrammatical sentences within each context with immersion and classroom learners? And is there an interaction with age of onset? Now uh, here, this is looking at um, their span. Remember I said that um, in red here, uh, you've got a very good span. You can remember a sequence well. If it's blue or bluer, you 
can't do it so well. So what we're looking at in the left top left is the hits that is actually de detecting things which are uh, you know they're grammatical. You know you get them right. Um, and in the UK, these non-native speakers in the UK. Um, <coughs> Their age of onset, let me just sort of bring that down, is not having the. F I'm so I'm staring very hard at this screen now. <laughs> um, to the, the thing, the thing that, that I want to say most is that those screens are not the same. There is a difference in performance between. Um, things which they've correctly identified as grammatical and the things which they have correctly rejected uh, as ungrammatical. Um, you can tell that um, having a good phonological short-term memory mitigates the effect of uh, the age you started on ungrammatical items. So if you started when you are 20 or 30 or 35, you can see that your scores are not very good. They're going down compared to the early learn, early starters. And that um, your phonological short-term memory, which is the red, the, the, the redder those dots, the better your phonological short-term memory are floating towards the top there. And floating towards the bottom are the things which are bluer or purpler. And they represent people whose phonological shorts of memory was not as good. And that's not what's going on when people are answering um, uh, or, or, or deciding on whether something which is grammatically correct, deciding that it is grammatically correct. This is implicit pattern learning and how many hits or how many correct rejections there are. And you can see that the better your implicit pattern learning ability, the more orange the dots are. And you've got an age of onset um, for, it doesn't seem to be much of an effect for getting things which are grammatical, noticing that they're right. But there's something maybe, just bring that up. Yes, that there's some mitigation for the, um, correctly rejecting things which are ungrammatical, the better your implicit pattern learning ability, the better your score. But there's no interaction with age of onset. So let's look at this one here. I'm just saying there's no main effect or interaction with phonological short term memory the non-native speakers in Poland. All right, they're the ones who've been in a classroom. Nothing's interacting. We measured their phonological short-term memory and their implicit pattern learning ability, and we didn't find an effect or an interaction. And we didn't find an effect for either of those things. Just leave that out there for a minute. So in sum, we're, we're saying that the context of learning is quite an important one. And that might be because the context of learning is molding what kind of knowledge you are acquiring. Right? If you're in an immersion setting where there's no explicit teaching, you're going to acquire a different sort of knowledge than if you're in a classroom where basically you're getting a lot of explicit teaching which ends up with explicit knowledge. So just to discuss a little bit here, the UK immersion learners, regardless of when they arrived, whether they were children or adolescents, or even young adults, were very good at detecting what sentences were grammatical. There's no age effect. The age effect was most pronounced for 
the correct rejection of ungrammatical items. It's looking at something which is not in English and saying it's not English. And having some benefit from an, a higher implicit pattern learning ability facilitated the rejection of things which weren't part of English, that is to say, they were part of the patterns of English. And phonological short-term memory did that as well, but only for the learners who were post-puberty. As children, it didn't matter. It didn't, it didn't make any difference. In Poland, by contrast, false alarming, which is to look at a sentence which is absolutely grammatical and say it's wrong, happened significantly more often there than in the UK. And there was a very, very clear finding that they were nearly as good at, at seeing that something which is, I mean, basically, if something is grammatical, they were much more likely to say it wasn't grammatical. Uh, that's from their classroom learning rather than their counterparts in the UK who hadn't learned the rules, had just been exposed to a lot of English. And in fact, these age of onset effects were most pronounced in Poland for false alarms of grammatical sentences. Right? So the older you were when you started, the more likely you were to look at something, you weren't looking, of course, you were listening to something which was fine, which was grammatical English, and declare that it wasn't grammatical English. And the phonological short-term memory and the implicit pattern learning ability didn't figure at all for those people. So, trying to sum all this up, remember we started from this idea that there are two routes to language, knowledge, implicit and explicit, and that children have only got the one route really. They can't use explicit reasoning because they're not cognitively mature enough to benefit from it. That's not controversial. And it's also not controversial to say that by the time you get to late childhood, puberty, early, uh, early adolescence, that you have the mature cognitive reasoning ability that you use for learning anything. You think about it, you reflect upon it. That can be brought into play when you're starting to learn a language if you are post-puberty, because you've got it as part of your toolkit. But is implicit learning preserved? Does it get, does it get completely sort of pushed out of the way? And if it is preserved, what are the conditions that preserve it? So, because we had such different results from these two cohorts on the grammaticality judgment test, and we knew what their phonological short-term memory performance was and their implicit, I don't know why I put IS though, that should be, oh, I know why. <laughs> I've called it either implicit sequence learning or implicit pattern learning. And here it's ISL, but it's the same thing. If we use those as diagnostic criteria for um, language learning, which is driven by data and is inductive and is implicit, then we would be able to conclude that the participants that we had in the classroom and the immersion contexts were doing so learning. Um, this leads us to a question which has fascinated me for, for years and years. How does anyone come to know implicitly, that is to say, um, that they're not able to express it, they're not able to say how they know it, but they know what is not part of a language? Merely by exposure to what is part of a language. So this is, this is a, the first language acquisition conundrum here, that um, in our first languages, we are only exposed to what is part of the language. We don't get uh, people telling us which is not part of the language. We don't, get, we don't get to read or listen to things which are not part of the language. 
but we although our exposure is only to things which are part of the language in terms of morphosyntax in terms of vocabulary in terms of um idiomatic expressions we come to know based on that what is not part of the language yeah we're able to reject in a grammaticality judgment test or an idiom test or whatever we're able to reject very quickly and easily things which are part of the language how does anyone come to know implicitly that a particular combination of words is not allowed rather than which is another possibility that you just haven't lived long enough in order to hear it right so by the time we're in our you know in our adulthood we, it's almost like and we have lived long enough we're not expecting to come across completely new rules or new combinations that are strange we're able to say no it's not part of the language and this is a quote from road and plout if i just move myself out of the way if a particular grammatical construction is not observed during some extended but finite exposure, childhood, shall we say, which is an immersion experience, one could safely assume that it is not part of the language. Right? That seems to be, we've got enough data, we are now confident that in this finite length of time of childhood that we can say that this is not part of the language this has not been observed so we may argue then from this sort of statistical learning um, perspective that something which is unrepresented underrepresented in all of the data which we're getting all of the time we're immersed in the language if something is not represented or underrepresented that that is what we base our native speaker intuitions on about what is therefore grammatical and what is not idiomatic right and a learner such as we had these people who started out as Polish speakers and who either became English speakers by staying in Poland and learning it in class or immigrating to Britain and learning it in, the, in an immersion context. For a learner to develop those kind of intuitions about what is not part of the language, they require probabilistic evidence about what is in the language, right? from what we could call a high fidelity representative sample high fidelity because well because it is it is faithful to itself it's internally consistent such as in fact such as is found in immersion settings and not in classrooms and that would explain that kind of learning that kind of that kind of building up of um Implicit knowledge is what explains ability to perform well in a grammaticality um, judgment. What the study was exploring was interaction of the age of onset and cognitive, these two cognitive aptitude abilities, really, um, how they underpin implicit learning how they enable implicit learning in these two contexts. Because we wanted to infer the extent uh, of the influence of implicit learning and how it still hangs around on ultimate morphosyntactic attainment uh, in language learners, L2 language learners, um, over the long term. So this, these are long, remember, we wanted a minimum of 12 years of exposure. So we examined these speakers who were either learning English as an L2 in an immersion context because they'd immigrated or in a classroom context because they hadn't immigrated, but they had learned English at school. And our findings, I would say, are confirming that even though all of the Polish uh, L1 participants uh, were very good at English 
that was actually a condition of them being, being part of uh, the study. Um, and they were very high functioning bilinguals and they used English on a daily basis and they used it for their work and they were using it obviously very effectively and very well. The context in which they had learned English shaped their morphosyntactic attainment um, depending on, you know, it was, did they immigrate or did they not immigrate? And so um, we saw interactions of age of onset with grammaticality and the role played by phonological memory and sequence learning. And these suggest really that qualitatively different types of knowledge, basically this implicit and explicit types, were underlying their task performance. So we observed, we would say, in our data, a dissociation between grammatical and ungrammatical performance. There was a grammaticality effect there. As age of onset was delayed in the naturalistic learners, the older they were when they arrived here, had an impact on how good they were at that grammaticality judgment test. But that effect of age was attenuated by, uh, or in rather, those who turned out to have a rather better phonological short-term memory and sequence learning ability. And so we think that what is we could propose here, Silcher and I, is that our results are reflecting a decline in the ability to learn from implicit negative evidence, implicit negative evidence that emerges naturally from, let's call it this, a continuous, statistically based learning mechanism learning mechanism you know that they've got in their minds that operates over a progressively lower fidelity language sample the older they get when they start the less fidelity they have in the language samples that they are encountering now you could say and people have said that uh, the grammaticality effects which we saw in the naturalistic learners um, in immersions were driven by learners' tendency to, um, to have a bias towards accepting sentences. <laughs> and that's possible that they are, you know, they think, oh, yes, it's right, it's right, it's right, that's grammatical, that's grammatical. Um, rather than uh, actually listening to their intuitions, attending to their intuitions, making judgments on them. Um, so that, that's one criticism you could, you could um, never let us. But we are standing by, I think, our conclusion that um, age and context and to some lesser extent, pattern learning and phonological short-term memory are all influences that, that have a bearing on an ability to know in any given language what's part of a language and what's not part of a language. This must be quite a relevant to everyone watching this. So what are the tips for publication in international journals? I wish I knew, actually, oh. because <laughs> maybe if I can take your question from a reviewer's point of view. Right. Do you like writing a paper? No, I hate it. Absolutely oh. hate it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a surprise. But, it's a really difficult task. Mm. The payoff is when you're done and you've got something really, really well polished. Which papers of yours do you remember the most? It was turned down within about a week. <laughs> wow, really? You know, the first time you see in a journal something written by you is special. <laughs>